Okay. Um, so I think it's working, yeah? You can hear me? Okay? Yeah. I okay. think everyone knows Nansen, so we can start the talk. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, by popular request, I'm supposed to be talking about infinite dimensional Lyophilus, and so I will. Um, so I'll give a couple motivations before we start, and I'll kind of give you a general kind of layout of what's going to be said in the talk. Um, so some motivations on why people care about infinite dimensional Lyophilus. So um, I'll, I'll give a bunch of reasons that I don't know that much about, and I'll give you the reason I kind of know a little bit more about, and then um, after that, probably applications won't be discussed too much. But um, some motivations, let's write down first. Um, so motivation. Oh, maybe I should say, um, before we get too far, um, at the end of the talk, um, if you're interested in giving a talk next week, then stick around and we'll um, schedule you in. Um, but anyways, okay, let's, let's continue then. So uh, motivation. Um, so some possible motivations come from number theory. Um, so infinite dimensional algebras actually play uh, not really a minor role, but uh, one kind of simple application number theory is just um, a derivation of these things called the McDonald identities. Um, which are infinite series identities. Um, identities, that's right. Um, coming from number theory, the simplest being um, the Jacobi triple product identity, if you've heard of that. Um, some other applications. Um, so one big, big application comes from group theory, um, finite group theory. So theory of finite groups. Um, so the largest simple group, sporadic simple group is called the monster group. Um, and allegedly, so I don't know much about it, but allegedly the best way to study this group is via um, what's called um, the monster vertex algebra, which is actually uh, an associated object that's acted upon a, by an infinite dimensional Lie group called um, the monster Lie group. So um, another place where infinite dimensional Lie algebras appear, and then kind of the place where um, my motivation is coming from and why I kind of started learning about these um, is quantum field theory, where it has applications um, in places like two-dimensional um, conformal field theories, where such algebras um, are will play the role of symmetry algebras of certain um, quantum field theories. So 2D CFT symmetry algebras. All right. Um, and, you know, more applications, we'll say. So they, they have lots of applications and lots of areas of math. Um, we're not going to focus too much on applications because, well, to actually get to an application would take some time. But maybe what we'll talk about instead is on um, well, well, we'll try to address a couple questions. Um, so question number one is going to be, um, well, kind of how to deal with these algebras. How to deal with, in quotes, these algebras. So in other words, um, can we come up with a meaningful um, realization of these algebras that's, say, easy to work with um, or understandable from the point of view of something that's already known? And we'll find that the answer is yes. Uh, most of these algebras can actually be realized in what are called um, central extensions of some more canonical um, infinite dimensional Lie algebras. Some canonical objects. And we'll kind of we'll, we'll come to what this means in the talk. And sort of the two examples I want to focus on are um, called the Virasor algebra. which I may um, end up skipping a little bit just based on time. Um, and a larger class of algebras, which are called um, affine Cotsmoody algebras. Um, and the specific example that we're gonna talk about is going to be this one. So SL2C hat, as it's called. Um, so that's sort of going to be the goal of the talk is how to deal with algebras like this um, and kind of investigate this statement and they can be realized as central extensions of certain canonical kinds of objects. Um, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the representation theory. So question two, if I were to write it, would say something about um, well, how does a representation theory look 
And what sort of computations can be done with this representation theory? Um, but we probably won't have time for that. So we'll just, this is a good enough question for right now. So um, let's draw a line. Let's continue. So um, first we should start with some background. And um, so the main background for studying these kinds of algebras um, is the theory of semi-simple Lie algebras. which, um, well, I'll assume that no one knows about. And if you do, well, it'll be boring for a little bit, but we'll get past it. So background, semi simple Lie algebras. First of all, what is even a Lie algebra? Um, so let's give a definition. So a Lie algebra um, is a vector space with a multiplication. Um, the multiplication in the room there is defined um, kind of looks like a face. So the Lie algebra I'll call G. Here's the highlighter. So this is the Lie algebra. And um, the multiplication has the following properties. It should be one bilinear. So linear in both variables. Um, two, it should be symmetric or anti-symmetric, sorry, it's kind of important. So I x, y is minus y, x. And finally, three, um, it should satisfy the Jacobi identity, which I'll write the first term in. You cannot see the bottom. Oh, sorry. How about? Oh, no, it's fine. OK. x, y, z plus, um, I'm going to write cyclic permutations. So cyclic permutations means I change, um, where's the pointer? X goes to the position of Y, Y goes to the position of Z, and Z goes to the position of X in the next term, and then furthermore. So I sum all cyclic permutations, and I set that equal to zero. So this is called the Jacobi identity. Um, and this is what the algebra is. So um, what is a semi-simple Lie algebra now? Well, for that, we'll use the definition of a Lie ideal. So um, an ideal in G um, is a vector subspace H, um, so a subset of G subspace, um, such that it's, well, same definition as, as coming from rings in algebra. It's closed under um, multiplication with anything from the algebra. So G or H with G is contained in H. So this is an ideal. And an algebra is called simple. So G is simple. If, um, well, the only proper sub ideals, um, sub ideal, I should say, and not R, but is the trivial one. So, zero. So, the only proper sub ideal should be the trivial one. Um, and it's called semi simple. And there's a, probably a better definition of semi simple, but the one we're going to give is going to be kind of more in line with what, the direction that we're going to be going. Um, semi simple. Um, if it's the direct sum, so I'm um, all right on alpha, of a bunch of simple Lie algebras. So each of these should be simple. So maybe an aside really quick about why we should care about, or why we do care about semi simple Lie algebras. Um, in particular, why we care for the purposes of um, constructing infinite dimensional Lie algebras. Um, the main reason, or the reason that's going to be relevant for us, um, is that they carry a nice inner product structure. So um, maybe I'll write in a different color. Um, so my simple Lie algebras. Carry um, a natural inner product. And this inner product is called the killing form, um, which was actually discovered by Carton. And um, well, it's inner product, of course, so I'll write this. And it has a special um, associativity property, which I'll write after I'm done writing this. So inner product, and it has the property that, um, well, x, y, 
with z is the same as um, x with y z. So it's a sort of this associated exact property, which will be useful for us. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we're actually interested in studying these algebras because they do carry this nice um, um, inner product structure, which will allow us to construct some things later down the line. Uh, so let's give uh, one, one example of such an algebra. So one example of such an algebra um, is called the special linear algebra of size two. And it is the set. I think we scroll up. It is the set of all um, two by two matrices um, with trace zero. And the multiplication, so the, the Lie bracket between two matrices, X and Y, um, is defined to be just um, XY minus YX. In fact, I forgot to mention earlier, but um, maybe something that's relevant. Um, given any associative algebra, such as say matrices um, with matrix multiplication, I can form Lie algebra by just defining the Lie bracket as defined here. So um, continuing, SL2C, two by two matrices with trace zero. Well, let's write down all two by two matrices with trace zero. Um, well, there's this one. That certainly has trace zero. Uh, there's this one, which also certainly has trace zero. And then finally, there's one more, um, at least one more linearly dependent one. This one. And these form a basis for um, SL2C, and they have the following commutational relations. So um, x with y is h, h with x is 2x, and h with y is minus 2y. So you can, um, well, how to compute this, you just take the matrices, you multiply them together, and you apply this nice formula right here. And you can check that these are the commutation relations that you end up with. Um, so maybe I'll write one more example, um, just for sake of notational purposes later. Um, so one more example, um, which isn't really an example, it's just for the purposes of notation. Again, um, if I have a Lie algebra G, um, and I have a basis for this Lie algebra, um, so TA, let's say, A equals one to the dimension of G, um, as a basis for G, um, then generically I'll write the Lie bracket like this. Um, so sum on C, um, I'll write F, A, B, C, um, T, B, let's change where I'm putting the indices, F, A, B, C, T, C. So it, well, if I take the linear common, or, uh, the Lie bracket of two basis elements, of course I should remain in the algebra. And so all this is stating is that what I should end up with on the right hand side um, is just a linear combination of things in the algebra because what I should get when I take the product of two elements of the algebra is another element of the algebra. And um, well, I just wrote it as a linear combination. I wrote it in this new basis. And these constants I'll call the structure constants. So these are called structure constants. So just for notation. Um, Okay, so I guess one more thing I wanted to mention um, as far as examples go. So I mentioned um, before this inner product. So maybe I should have mentioned that before, I guess. But um, so this inner product, um, let's write it out what, what it is for SL2C. So for SL2C, it ends up being just um, four times the trace of, um, well, I used X and Y, right? so we'll use M, N. And this is the bracket of M and N. So um, you can check this as your product. It has those nice properties that I outlined before, which are written uh, here. And um, well, it actually does define a well-defined inner product. And I'll actually, well, I'll write what the non-trivial non um, inner products are. So X with Y, X and Y are coming from that basis I wrote before. It's going to be four in this case, and um, H with H, supposed to be an H, sorry, is going to be eight, and all the other end products are equal to zero. 
So it's an undifferentiated product. This is the killing form for SL2C. The four is just, you can kind of ignore it. It's normalization constant that makes things sort of consistent. Um, but that's what it is. Um, okay, so that's sort of all the background we need from semi-simple Lie algebras. We have examples in place, so maybe you have an okay idea of what a semi-simple Lie algebra is. Um, maybe something else I'll just note for purposes of um, completeness. Um, all semi-simple Lie algebras sort of act in the same way that SL2C does. Um, they have a very um, well, constrained structure, we'll say. They're completely classified, first of all. And they have a sort of constrained structure, which is sort of almost the same. It's just a SL2C with extra steps, we'll say. Um, but anyways, okay, so our goal is to talk about infinite dimensional Lie algebras. And so the next thing we need to talk about, um, you would think would be uh, infinite dimensional Lie algebras, but actually we'll need one more concept, um, which is just easier to introduce in the finite dimensional case. Um, and this thing is called, or this concept, I guess, is called um, central extension. We need to talk about central extensions. So um, what is a central extension? Um, and why do we care is something that maybe I'll address, but um, for right now, we'll just talk about what a central extension is. So I'll try to be as informal as possible with this definition so, so as not to bore you. Um, so we're interested, um, in extensions of our original algebra, whatever it happens to be. So it could be, you know, SL2C um, by well, another Lie algebra or another element, we'll say, an algebra, I'll say H, um, which is um, central in the sense that um, it commutes with everything. So it belongs to the center, in other words, of the new algebra. So very formally, well, um, as rigorously as possible, what this means is that I have um, an exact sequence H, um, and we'll call the extended algebra. I don't know. I'm running out of fractal letters. I'm not very good at drawing them. So um, how about E, I guess? Um, so that H um, lies in the center of E, and um, well, each of these is homomorphism. But really what you could think is that E is just as um, a vector space. Um, it's just the direct sum of G and H. And if I take commutators of anything in G with anything in H, um, then I get zero. So maybe a, an example. And the only reason I'm going to introduce this example is because it actually gets trivial and we want to eventually ignore examples like this. So trivial central extension. Um, so it's enough to, well, since H has to belong to the center, it's enough to just consider one dimensional algebras. And so we'll consider H to just be um, well, one dimensional with basis uh, C hat. So it's a one dimensional algebra. Um, we can just extend by one element every time. And um, am I back on pen? Yes, okay, good. So an example of a trivial extension is just to define the bracket of, um, so even our Lie algebra G, define the bracket of an element. Um, so we'll say X C with Y C, maybe K1 C, K2 C, um, just to be, well, the bracket of X, Y, and generally the bracket of K1, oops, sorry, bracket, that rotation. Let's restart that, sorry. Um, so the bracket of X and Y, and then the bracket of C and C, but that's going to be zero, so I'll just write zero. So this is an example of a trivial central extension. Um, and it's always possible to make such extensions. So I'm given any algebra and given any, well, extra element that I want to add, I can always make this kind of extension. And in, in that sense, it's actually trivial. We don't really care about it. Um, so what we do care about, what is a non-trivial example of a central extension? Well, it's kind of hard to answer because actually in the case that I've outlined so far, there end up being none. 
Um, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So um, what a, a, a non-trivial central extension might look like. So non-trivial example might look something like, um, so the bracket of x with c, y, uh, k1c, k2c, is going to be well, x, y, plus something that belongs to the center, maybe a constant or a coefficient that goes in front. It's all right. Um, how about plus f of x and y, which is just some number. So this belongs to complex numbers times c with zero. So generically, a uh, non-trivial central extension might look like this. But actually, I've um, not really misled you, but maybe I have misled you. Um, in the, the case that we've outlined, actually, um, there are no non-trivial central extensions. So let me state a theorem. So the theorem says that semi-simple Lie algebras are rigid. Um, in other words, they admit um, no non-trivial central extensions. Um, which, you know, if you want to take it as motivation, you could take, take it as motivation for um, well, why we might want to start considering infinite dimensional Lie algebra. So maybe I should add a word here, which is important, finite dimensional. So in the infinite dimensional case, we'll actually be able to say something. Um, but in the finite dimensional case, we can't. Um, so for that reason, in the finite dimensional case, they're not really all that interesting. But in the infinite dimensional case, they actually end up being interesting. So um, that's sort of what we'll talk about next. Um, before we do that, maybe we should talk about how to actually construct um, such extensions. Um, even though, well, as of right now, it seems kind of dumb to talk about how to construct something that can't exist. Um, but nevertheless, um, it will be useful to talk about it just because um, it's a useful concept to introduce, and it will kind of give us motivation for what to look for when we go to the interdimensional case. So, um, question. Um, how to construct central extensions? And, um, well, the short answer is the algebra homology, <laughs> but that's not a pretty purely enlightening answer. Um, so the longer answer, um, which I'll give, is actually we need two things. Um, two things. Um, one, we need a derivation. On G, so um, I didn't give the definition, so I'll give it here. What is a derivation? Well, derivation is a map um, from G to G, which has what's first of all linear, um, just like a derivative. And it also has um, a Leibniz type property. So um, on products, it has this Leibniz type, type property. It, has, um, it acts on the first element plus it acts on the second element. So this is like Leibniz rule. So we need this. Um, these are not too terribly hard to construct. Um, and we'll need one more thing. Um, we'll need um, a non-degenerate. Um, I mean, we don't need the non-degenerate because I'm going to put the word inner product instead of bilinear form, but inner product. So we need a non-degenerate inner product, which um, we're in luck. We already have. We talked about it at the beginning. It's the killing form. So um, at least item two we already have in the finite dimensional case. Um, and actually, um, I'll, I'll just mention. Actually, in the, the finite dimensional case, we even have one. But it turns out that the derivations we have are of a certain type that uh, makes us the, the central extensions we get end up being trivial. Um, so this will always produce a central extension for us. Um, how? Well, all right. So um, kind of a follow-up question. How? How do the two things actually construct um, a central extension for us? Well, um, I'll just write the answer. Um, 
So given um, our extendedly alpha, E, which is going to be as a vector space, G plus this new center along, um, we define a new Lie bracket. So X with K1C, Y with K2C is going to be defined as, oh, sorry. Okay, we're good. Um, the bracket of X and Y plus phi of x, y times c, zero. Of course, the second element will always be zero because, well, it has to be central. And what is phi? Well, phi of x and y is defined using um, this derivation and this inner product. So it's defined as dx, y. So it's, it's a number, first of all, as we can see from this. And the number is defined using the derivation here and the inner product here. And it should have a certain property, so uh, we'll not get into too many details, but um, essentially, generically, any derivation will work, we can do. So um, this actually defines for us a new Lie algebra, which is a central extension, so theorem if you want. Um, with this definition of the Lie bracket, um, this defines for us a one-dimensional central extension of G. Now, it turns out that if G is finite dimensional and D and the killing form are coming from a finite dimensional Lie algebra, then semi-simple the algorithm. Then, well, what we get is trivial. But in the infinite dimensional case, we'll actually be able to construct non-trivial examples, um, which will be of interest for us because they are the algorithms that are of interest later. Right. So now we can um, finally start with the talk. <laughs> infinite dimensional the algorithm. So, And the definition that we're going to take um, is just going to be, well, a Lie algebra whose dimension is infinite. So the two examples that we're going to work with um, are, well, preliminary examples to the examples that I wanted to talk about, which were the Euros algebra and the um, well, affine Katsukuti algebras. Um, so let's give those examples now. Um, so example number one, um, which is probably the one that I'm going to focus on the most, um, it's going to be called uh, the loop algebra of um, a semi-simple Lie algebra. So how is it defined? Um, well, we can consider this algebra. Uh, well, it's denoted usually L of G for a loop, I guess. And um, how is it defined? Well, it's defined as the set of all um, F, um, such that F is a C infinity function, so a smooth function um, from the circle, hence the word loop, into our Lie algebra. And this is essentially equivalent to writing, um, well, you can think this is equivalent to writing this F as a Fourier series with coefficients um, coming from Lie algebra itself. So lambda is the number of complex functors one. So um, the loop algebra is the algebra of semis or functions from the circle into the Lie algebra. Um, how is it a Lie algebra? Well, we need to define a bracket, and we'll define it in sort of the obvious way. Um, so Let's define it on our basis. So what is the basis for this space? Well, um, given a basis, and I think I was using TA before. Um, so given a basis TA for G, um, well, we can construct a basis for the loop algebra um, by just, well, appending lambda to the end. And I'll find this new element to be T A N. So this is um, an element of the, a basis element for the loop algebra. I mean, we can kind of see, just given the above definition in terms of a Fourier series, um, that, well, this is actually a basis for the loop algebra. So what should its bracket be um, with another element of the loop algebra? T A N T um, B M. Well, let's actually write out what this is. Well, this is um, T A lambda the n, g b lambda the m. And since lambda n, lambda m are 
complex numbers. Um, they can be pulled out of the unit product. And so I can write this as the bracket of TA, TB, lambda to the N plus M, which I can further express um, using the structure constants that I wrote about before as a sum over C, F, A, U, A, B, C, T, C, lambda to the N plus M, which um, well, using our definition here, we see is actually equivalent um, so just writing sum on C, F, C, A, B, um, T, C, N plus M, which is linear combination of elements from the original algebra. So it's closed under the multiplication. And um, I didn't really mention it, but it's also closed under the vector space operations just because C infinity functions are. So this makes it into a well-defined algebra. And well, because well, let's count the number of basic elements, well, we have an index N here, which runs over the natural number. So it's automatically infinite dimensional. So, um, we have now our first example of an infinite dimensional D algebra, which is interesting in its own right, but for our purposes will not be interesting. Um, the more interesting object um, that we want to eventually study. So maybe I'll write preview. Um, the object that we're going to be interested in is something called um, the well, affine continuity algebra. So So we can actually construct this algebra by centrally extending um, the loop algebra that we just wrote here. So a, a certain central extension of this algebra will, will provide for us um, an example of an affine cuts with the algebra. And um, we'll, let's remember, recall what we actually needed to discuss, um, well, central extensions to start with. Even in the infinite case, we needed two things. We needed an inner product, which we sort of kind of already have. Um, we think that the inner product on, well, the actual underlying semi-simple the algebra may be extended in a natural way, we'll say, um, to the full loop algebra. And actually that we'll find that it is the case. Um, essentially just using properties of the original inner product that we had and hoping that they pass to the well, infinite dimensional case. Furthermore, we needed um, a derivation. And we know that there are sort of no non-trivial derivations on just the Lie algebra part. So the part just concerning um, well, these objects, the basis elements. But well, that, that was from the finite dimensional case, I should say. But in the infinite dimensional case, we have um, an extra kind of place where we can make a derivation, um, where we can take derivatives. And this defines, um, well, on this algebra, this actually defines a derivation as well. So taking a derivative and multiplying by lambda to the n um, defines for us an example of a derivation. There's infinitely many of them. So we have a couple of choices to make, um, but we have examples of non-trivial derivations, which is good. So we have sort of all of the ingredients in place to actually do the extension of this algebra. We just have to do it. Um, but we'll maybe come to that in a second. Um, how am I doing on time? I'm doing okay. Okay, so maybe we do have time to discuss the zero algebra a little bit. So I'll mention my own second example then, which is going to be uh, what's called the Witt algebra. Um, so what is the Witt algebra? Um, so it's usually denoted by W, and it is the algebra of um, orientation preserving smooth vector fields. Um, the circle. So what does this mean? Because it's kind of a very Cage definition. Well, a generic element x in W um, can be written as um, well x of theta multiplying dd theta. So it's an operator acting on smooth functions um, with coefficients being smooth functions themselves. So this is a smooth function. Uh, maybe I should be consistent with notation. So um, the circle is e to the i theta in this case which before was lambda, but hopefully there's not too much confusion here. Um, so this is an example of a, a smooth vector, a vector field. And well, something to check is actually that they are as well um, closed under multiplication. Um, it's definitely worth checking once in your life. I won't do it here, but um, if you've never done it before, um, it's definitely worth trying. Well, act these on a test function, f, c infinity function, and make sure that what you end up with is an object of the same type. is still a smooth function multiplying dd theta. 
Um, so again, we're going to write out a basis for these things. So a basis. Well, let's recall that um, or the definition. So x is written as um, a smooth function on the circle times dd theta. And since any smooth function can be decomposed as a Fourier series, so um, cn to the in theta, dd theta. And I can always write this as, um, well, in terms of a, as a linear combinations of these things. So this is what I'll take as my basis. And I'll define ln to be minus e to the i n plus one data, dd data. Um, the n plus one and the minus sign are just, um, well, it's convention, we'll say. But clearly this is a basis just based on um, this definition. And what are the Lie brackets? Well, ln, that doesn't really look like a null, sorry. ln with lm is going to be n minus m, l, n plus m. Um, so just, uh, I'll, I'll say fun fact. Um, actually, the, uh, an algebra that we're already familiar with is uh, appears in this algebra as a subalgebra. Um, SL2C is actually the same as the, the word span should go here, but I'm not going to write it. Um, just these three basis elements. So the span of three ba these three basis elements, well, first of all, have the same commutation relations as SL2C and um, span the same dimension of the vector space. And so they're isomorphic as the algebras. So actually, these two algebras are the same. Um, this is not a coincidence. Um, if you're familiar with um, well, Mobius transformations and complex analysis in general, um, it may be a little less coincidental than you think, but just a fun fact for right now. So um, the, the note that I want to make about this Lie algebra, um, so again, what word did I use before? I used um, preview. Okay, so we'll use preview again. Um, preview. So this algebra um, can be centrally extended. And its central extension actually becomes the Virasoro algebra. So it produces for us what's called the Virasoro algebra, which is the other algebra I mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to eventually talk about. Okay, good. Um, so now let's actually talk about, um, well, the central extensions of these algebras. So, central extensions. So let's start again with the loop algebra. LG. So the loop algebra. And like I said, um, let's recall that what we actually needed to produce a central extension um, was just two things. We needed an inner product. So we need to produce an inner product and also an appropriate derivation. So these are needed. And then we have a natural way to define um, well, a central extension, and then we can kind of produce this new algebra. Um, why this new algebra is important, if I have time, I'll discuss. But um, for right now, let's just try to accomplish the task at hand. So the, the first task is how to actually well, extend um, this, in this inner product that we had on the underlying the algebra. So we'll go back a page and let's look. So the loop algebra was, uh, if you remember, the, the algebra of smooth functions. Um, from S1 into the Lie algebra. And it had natural inner product structure on just the algebra itself. So the question is, can we extend on this inner product structure to the full loop algebra? And the answer is yes, sort of. And there's lots of ways to do it. Um, so one way to do it is to define TAM, TAM, or TBM to be, well, whatever the inner product of TA was, TB was, um, but times some constant depending on n and m. And the name of the game, or essentially the idea of what we're going to try to do, is come up with conditions on the C and m so that um, well, this inner product satisfies all of the necessary constraints. So how do we do this? Um, well, we want that this inner product, so want, we want this inner product actually carries the same um, structure as the one the killing form did in the final dimensional case. So um, we would like that this happens. T A N T B M um, T C N M. How about L? Is the same as 
G A M T B M P C L. And requiring this along with Jacobi identity um, will actually give us constraints, constraints on the CNM. So um, I'll spare you the details and I'll just read you the result. Um, so essentially what happens by imposing these constraints, um, we end up with, uh, let me pull it out. Where did I write it? Here? Yes. Um, so essentially what we end up with, sorry, is the constraint that um, T A M T B M is going to end up being T A T B, and then these constant C and M actually end up being well an arbitrary overall scale constant times a Dirac delta function, n plus m, and I think zero is what I want. So in other words, on this object, um, just for sake of clarity, I'll write. Um, so delta n plus m zero is equal to one if n plus m is equal to zero and zero otherwise. So um, it ends up turning out that this natural inner product structure arises. I'm um, just imposing this nice constraint here. Um, similarly, um, we talked about one more object that we need. So we have an inner product now. So I'll write inner product. Check mark. Highlight the box or something. I don't know. Um, and we needed one other object, if you remember. So the other object we needed was a derivation. So um, I want, um, I'll say, non trivial, quote unquote, derivation. It turns out that we end up with a whole family of them. Um, so these objects, um, you can check our derivations, but it's, it's sort of clear because the idea of derivation sort of originally came from this notion of taking a derivative. And now we come back to that. So it, it's still a derivative. So this is our derivation. They all end up producing essentially the same central extension. It turns out by same, I mean isomorphic central extension. So the, the resulting algebra is isomorphic, but you know, details, details, it's the same algebra at the end. So I, Writing down this non trivial derivation, um, we have the two objects that we need. So, this is our non trivial derivation. Um, go back a page. This is our non trivial inner product. And so, now we have all the ingredients we need to actually construct a central extension. And so, um, oh, we can actually write out uh, the result. So, TN, uh, how was I writing indices before? Not like that, I don't think. TAN, TBM is going to be, well, T A M T A M A plus um, so this is the bracket in the original algebra, the loop algebra, sorry. And this is the bracket in the central extended algebra, which we're eventually going to call the cut speed algebra. It's going to be denoted by G hat. Well, this is just on this is the same bracket, but the, the new bracket, I guess. Okay, Wait, sorry, start over. Um, this is the this is the bracket in the loop algebra and the, the bracket in the new algebra, the eccentric extended algebra is going to be defined as the original bracket plus um, a function just like we had before. Um, not x and y, sorry, of t a n t b m c. And what is this object? Um, well, it's what we said it was before. Phi of dot dot is going to be this, and again, um, by plugging in all of the, the definitions in the appropriate places, we'll actually find that um, it ends up being N T A T B delta N plus M zero. So this is the constant that we end up with. This is the term that gets put in our central extension. Oh, shit. Um, sorry. So that's the term that gets added. And so what does our new lead bracket look like on this central extended algebra? Well, it looks like this TAN, TBM is um, the bracket in the original algebra, which we can actually write out, we might as well. Uh, it's going to be T, C, F, C, A, B, N plus M. Summation on C implied here, I'm gonna kind of employ Einstein summation convention for fun. 
um, plus uh, well, this other term, n, the bracket of g a, g b, in the product, delta n plus m, n zero. So this is our new uh, Lie bracket on the central extended algebra. And so this is uh, well, the defining commutation relations of what's called the affine cups in the algebra. Um, of G, and it's usually denoted by um, G hat. So this is the algebra. So this is um, our first non-trivial example of an affine, or of an infinite dimensional, interestingly algebra. Um, the reason it's interesting is it, well, it plays the role of um, what's called a current algebra in certain control field theories. Um, so there are these things called Westing the Witten model, models, which um, model things like, I don't know, um, is Roswell here? <laughs> Let's, uh, no, he's not, so I can, I can say whatever I want. Um, model things like, so there's simple models of two-dimensional quantum gravity. Um, they also model, uh, well, they're supposed to model um, the fractional quantum Hall effect um, at certain levels, we'll say. So relevant physical models actually um, appear out of these. Um, so, so it's an important algebra, is the point. Um, it appears in physical applications and in other places as well, I'm sure, but that was interesting to me. So, um, okay, so the other algebra that we were talking about from before um, was this Witt algebra um, down here. So the algebra of uh, smooth functions, or smooth vector fields, I guess, orientation proving smooth vector fields. So we can also center extended. So um, give us a row as central extension of width. Um, the idea is going to be sort of the same, but we're not going to hope for as much. So um, we're going to kind of ignore. Um, so it's sort of an abstraction of what we were doing before. What we really need, um, instead of looking for, well, a derivation d in a product um, with the appropriate compatibilities um, to produce the central exception. We actually need a map phi, which is sort of what I was writing every time. And we need this map phi. And really all we need is to ensure that phi has the appropriate property. So what property should phi have? Um, well, phi, by looking at the properties of D and inner product, um, phi should have an anti-symmetry condition. Um, it should be linear. And it should satisfy some sort of, um, I'll say Jacobi type identity, plus cyclic permutations is equal to zero, which were satisfied by the phi that we defined using the bracket in D. But really the important properties that we were obtaining from um, this map phi were exactly what I wrote here. So these properties are really the, the relevant ones. Um, so we can kind of forget that they came from D and inner product and just focus on the fact that we need these properties to actually produce a central extension. Um, such an object, generically speaking, is called a two cycle. Um, for well, cohomological reasons. I don't think I said that word right, but anyways. Um, so it's called a two-core cycle. And um, the idea is going to be the same as what we did before. To produce a central extension, what are we going to do? Um, well, we're going to write, uh, well, what the Lie bracket should look like. Um, it's supposed to equal n minus m, l, n plus m plus a constant for uh, this phi, which is a constant, of course, um, depending on ln, ln, multiplying c hat. So this is what the new inner product should look like. And the idea is going to be we're going to apply the Jacobi identity. So we're going to take ln, lm, and I can't use ll, so lk maybe, um, plus the orientations is equal to zero. Um, and using this identity, um, we'll end up with constraints on phi. And it turns out that these constraints are actually enough to determine what phi is. So um, phi of ln and ln, I'll just write the results for you, although it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's fun to try it for yourself. Um, the first time around, it's, it's pretty interesting, I think. So um, phi of ln ln is going to be um, n, n squared minus one over 12, the 12 is just a normalization convention, um, delta n, Minus n. So um, 
which is actually what I was writing before, delta n plus m zero. So it's actually the same delta function you can check. So this is um, the two quick cycle for the zero sort algebra. So the commutation relations become, I'll just write for zero sort. So ln, ln is n minus m, ln plus m plus um, n, n squared minus one over 12. Um, delta n minus m c n. So these are the commutation relations for the Virasoro algebra. algebra. Um, why is it relevant? Um, well, it is the symmetry algebra of the conformal group in two dimensions. So um, the short history of the conformal group. So conformal transformation, first of all, is an angle preserving transformation. And um, if I compose two such transformations, um, they form a group. So in three dimensions and higher, um, it's a theorem of, I think, Louisville, that the group is actually finite dimensional. So um, in n greater than or equal to three dimensions, um, this group is finite dimensional. So it's a lead group first of all, but it's a finite dimensional lead group. However, in two dimensions, um, the group is not only, um, well, not finite dimensional, it's, it's, it's huge, it's infinite dimensional. So I guess what I want to say is it's infinite dimensional, yeah. Um, it's, it's a huge group. Um, and its symmetry algebra um, is precisely this one. So that's one reason people are interested in the algebra, especially from the point of view of um, well, conformal field theories, um, because they describe, well, most, so very, very informally, um, conformal field theory is the study of symmetry algebras of the theory in question. And if the theory has a conformal symmetry, then well, the relevant group to study in two dimensions is this one in its algebra, I guess. Um, so I'm kind of running short on time, but maybe I'll, I'll um, stop here and let questions. I was gonna talk a little bit about representation theory, which is sort of where things become a little bit more interesting and more applications can actually be discussed. But we have five minutes and I don't have time for that whole thing. So um, maybe I'll stop there. So thanks. Any questions? Uh, I have a kind of a small question. Can you go two slides back? Two slides back? Yeah. Sure. Uh, your definition of co-cycle. Co-cycle. One more. Was it this slide? Here. Yeah. Is, is that right? Phi of x, y equals negative phi of x, y? Shouldn't oh, it be flipped? Sorry, yeah, you're right. Good catch. Um, so I said anti-symmetric, symmetric, but then I wrote um, it should be zero. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. Good catch. So it should be anti-symmetric, yeah. Sorry about that. And um, another question, just okay. vaguely. Uh, so uh, is Virasoro algebra the easiest infinite dimensional algebra that you can centrally extend, get a non-trivial central extension? So it, means, it depends what you mean by easy. Um, if you have this idea of, I need to construct a two co-cycle to do, well, to construct a central extension, a non-trivial central extension, then I'd say sort of, um, there's sort of a trick to the Virasoro one. Um, you need to make a change of basis when you're doing this derivation. Um, because the idea is, again, the same as for affine cuts from the algebra. The idea is that you use essentially conditions of the algebra, um, re repeated use of the Jacobi identity. Um, to produce constraints on the tuple cycle. And then from there, you can actually write it down explicitly. Um, so in some sense, affine cuts moody objects are actually easier um, just because there are no real tricks. Um, given that you know that there is a very canonical way to construct a tuple cycle using an inner product in a derivation, um, then well, generically, this is true. Um, you can just construct. For the Virasoro, it's a little bit more refined. Um, it's the same idea. And actually, in principle, you do the same thing. Um, you write down tuple cycle and write down some constraints. But about halfway through the derivation, you have to make some weird kind of um, change of basis. And it makes things a little messy, but it works out. So, okay, and one, and yeah. And one last question um, Are you necessarily guaranteed to get a non trivial, uh, of having a non trivial central extension for an infinite dimensional uh, Lie algebra? So, no, not in general. Um, the way not to check general. would be to look at the second Lie cohomology group. Um, so central extensions are characterized by, um, well, this cohomology group. Um, and well, computations aren't particularly easy to do. Can you see me at all? 
um, I don't want to shut the general screen yet, but um, a good book to look in um, is G.B. Fuchs, um, Chronology of Information Being Algebra. Um, this is a good book. I don't know if you can see my screen, but I'll show you. Yeah, after. Um, hold on. Yeah, hold it for a little longer. Oh, you want to hold it up again? Yeah, yeah. It's a long time. All right. Okay, there we go. go. No, it's a good book. Um, so maybe the only reason it's not good is it has this nasty typewriter font, which everyone hates. It's fine. Um, but, you know, old book is what you get. Any other questions or can I be free? Can I ask a question? Sure. So do you have some like uh, uh, commutative subgroup of this versor algebra? Well, C is the obvious example, yeah. Um, but it tells you this is yeah, non commutative, right? Oh, so you want non commutative subgroups? Um, so, in general, no. So, Vera Soro has, I'm pretty sure, well, it's essentially one, but it's the same one every, every time. You can still see my screen, so I'm going to write something. Um, mm -hmm. So, you can check that these three will always be a sub algebra um, for any fixed n. Uh huh. So, commutative. This is always a sub algebra, and it's always isomorphic to SL2C, um, maybe with a multiplying factor up front. Um, but the simplest one, of course, is just, um, you know, L minus one, L one, L zero. How about infinity? Mm. Infinite dimensional sub algebras? Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't think there are any. Maybe there are, I'm not an expert on the virus or algebra and its subgroups or sub, sub algebras, but I think there are none. Although they're actually more interesting on extensions. So, uh, one thing that people do um, when doing these extensions, you start with a very canonical object and you look for extensions in, um, well, that are central, but maybe in a different sense, um, over some other ring, say. Um, yeah, that's not quite the right way to describe it. Um, there are other extensions that people look for, I'll say, um, which are still central in some sense, um, but are different, namely different. And um, some people, in, it, there was a lot of work in this in the 90s by people in mathematical physics, people like um, uh, Bernard and um, some integrable systems people that you would probably know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a reference later. Okay. <laughs> so it's actually related to some integrable hierarchy, right? Yeah, so um, there's applications to this in integrable hierarchies. Um, so if I had time, I would have talked about something okay. called um, yeah. I would highest weight representations. <laughs> and um, uh, when other people are done asking questions and you figure out the talk for next week, if you want to keep talking about that, I'd be interested. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Um, so let me finish answering Fidong's question, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry. I forgot what your question was, Fidong. Something about integral okay. Yeah, so integral systems and um, these types of algebras, yeah? Yeah. So, um, a principle, all right, which is due to um, Victor Cutts and Wakamoto. I don't know Wakamoto's first name, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Is that given a representation of one of these affine Cutts Moody algebras, you can produce um, an integral hierarchy. Which one? KP hierarchy? Um, so that's okay. an example. So, um, so if the, one of these algebras is what's called GL infinity. Um, so this affine cuts with the algebra, then what you do get is, um, well, KP hierarchy. If it's what's called, um, a, if it's the, well, the affine cuts with the algebra of the Lie algebra of type A1, um, then what you get is KP hierarchy. So this is, um, or KDV, so this is KP hierarchy, this is KDV hierarchy. Um, and the list keeps going. There are lots of kind of interesting questions and directions in this area, but then um, we would need a separate talk about integral systems to actually. Yeah, okay. Cool. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Um, so before, before we go on to anything else, um, who wants to speak next week? Any volunteers? If there are, email me. Um, we'll probably help message some people on Saturday, maybe, um, and see if anyone's, if I can book anyone. But if anyone's like dying to give a talk, um, or even just kind of mildly wants to give a talk, let us know, and we'll schedule you. And let me stop sharing my screen, actually. And let me stop recording. Um, maybe I should do one at a time. 
Structure. There we go. 